Good morning and welcome to today's webinar from East Capital Group. My name is Marcus Rogmark and I'm a member of the sales team here at East Capital Group. Today's webinar will focus on the outlook for global frontier markets as well as East Capital's Global Frontier Markets Fund. So for this, I'm very happy to have uh, with me Emre Akchakmak, our head of Frontier Markets. Welcome, Emre. Thank you, Marcus. So uh, first of all, we're very happy to see uh, such a large number of participants with us today and also from a range of um, very diverse institutions. So with that in mind, Emre, I'd like to ask you to start off with just the brief investment case for Frontier Markets and the key characteristics of the asset class. It might come as a repetition to many of the participants today, uh, but I know that we have some uh, new uh, participants as well. I think it might look a bit boring if you listen to this before, but that's the exact point. I realized we were turning around the presentation here uh, and slides. But the good thing about frontier markets is that investment case doesn't change overnight. Uh, we are not commodity oriented. We are not uh, investing in cyclical businesses. These countries are having structural growth stories. I think that's the most important point about the investment case. Uh, you have structural growth stories that are here to stay and uh, economic growth should be higher than not only compared to emerging markets, but also compared to uh, developed markets as well. Yeah. So uh, you have fast economic growth, uh, structurally driven by uh, demographics and reforms. Uh, you have, uh, I think, if you're not familiar with the investment universe, uh, this is the most surprising aspect about frontier markets. You have lower standard deviation compared to emerging and developed markets. Developed markets are having um, a lower standard deviation, of course, compared to emerging markets, but frontier markets due to low correlations among all these markets uh, having even lower standard deviation and typically leading to lower drawdowns when it comes to times of volatility. And the third point is the valuations. Uh, this might change over time. I guess first two points, uh, I'm pretty confident that correlations will not increase overnight. Economic growth will not be coming down overnight. Uh, but valuations might change. And if we are right about the investment case, this should improve. But as we speak, we are close to all time low valuations, both uh, in absolute and relative terms. So maybe just uh, what does it mean uh, if you look at the investment case? And that's the summary of that, uh, everything that I've been talking about. If you invest in frontier markets, you have a very good opportunity to generate excess returns. Uh, if you look at annualized returns over the last 10 years, the best market has been the US with 11%, close to 11% uh, return per annum. Developed markets, of course, driven by the US also had high returns, but our strategy was able to generate returns that are uh, almost matching the US and developed markets. And that was coming along with Japan and Switzerland like uh, volatility due to the diversification. So the bottom line is that uh, you have high economic growth, which should translate into high expected returns. And when you uh, mix all these markets together, it is two plus two equals five. Uh, you get the benefits of diversification ending up with uh, lower standard deviation compared to individual markets. Thank you, Emre, and uh, great visualization uh, about the performance there that we managed to achieve from a risk return perspective. Uh, clearly, you know, we're overwashed every day with news flow from developed markets as well as emerging markets, whereas frontier markets, uh, you know, lives a bit uh, in the limelight of these two uh, with less news flow. Um, so can you just comment a bit on the big picture for frontier markets today? And, you know, what are the most recent dynamics with regards to inflation, uh, currencies, risk mm -hmm. appetites, mm -hmm. and also how frontier markets are likely to fare with US rate cuts now finally uh, coming into play as well? Yeah, so I think that we have a lot of uh, meat that we need to uh, prove otherwise. Uh, frontier markets are thought to be very high inflation markets, uh, extremely adventurous markets. They are not on the front page of the Financial Times, perhaps, except for negative news. But when you look at these markets, 
majority of the markets uh, from inflation perspective, we talked about growth. Growth is there, but also from inflation perspective, you have a few outliers. Uh, Egypt is having, you know, close to 30% inflation. Nigeria is having 30%, but that's fine. Uh, Nigeria five years ago, 10 years ago was low inflation. Egypt was the same. So we'll have always these kind of opportunities. Uh, sometimes, you know, markets are lost. Sometimes markets are coming back. But now if you look at the markets, I would say that 90% of frontier markets are below 10% when it comes to inflation. And majority of frontier markets that we invest in are having below 5% inflation. So inflation is not a major problem. And uh, in fact, if you also look at the chart here, you'll see uh, most of the markets, especially in the GCC, are having lower inflation compared to the US. So in the bigger scope of things, inflation is not a major issue for frontier markets. It is low. It gives way for investments and more rate cuts in frontier markets as well going forward. When you look at the currencies, this has been a challenging ride, of course. Uh, but again, on the currency side, uh, I think the impression when you hear about frontier markets and if you are not following them uh, that closely, you have an impression that, uh, you know, all these currencies are all over the place. Uh, they are losing 20, 30 percent a year. But let's have a look at our strategy. I think this is a good representation of uh, what to expect as well. So most of the currencies in our strategy, as you can see also from the moments, uh, last one year and three years. These are stable currencies. 65% of the currencies that we invest with uh, are in very stable economies or economies with pegged currencies. So half of these 65% are pegged. And when we say pegged, we are talk talking about pretty strong pegs, uh, such as the one in uh, Kuwait, in Morocco, in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE. But apart from the pegged currencies, we have also hard currencies. In Slovenia, it's euro. In Romania, it's closely tracking euro. So if you take everything together, you have two thirds pretty stable. And the second group of risk would be the currencies that are somewhat fundamentally vulnerable, but that are also behind uh, with their major depreciation. What am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, Egypt, for instance. It is not the best currency, and as you can see, it's been losing a lot over the last one and three years. But going forward, after having lost 70% in three years and 40% in one year, and major devaluation came in the beginning of this year, we don't expect any more major devaluations on the way, at least in the next few years. So we count some of these currencies among the second group. Uh, these could be either fundamentally strong currencies, or currencies that are done with their devaluation. And some of them are in the third group. So the bottom line here is that we are looking at maybe 90, 95% in pretty stable currencies and five to 10% in more adventurous currencies or less predictable currencies. But we are closing them very, uh, you know, I mean, we are following them very closely. And when we invest in companies in these markets, these companies are usually those which will benefit from further depreciation. And if we tie the discussion to Fed rate cut cycles, I think it's very difficult. And I don't like personally um, these uh, information pieces, right? What happened over the last 50 years with the rate cuts with elections, because every period is a different period. But I think the general conclusion can well be that the US dollar uh, appreciates along with rate hikes. This is what happened also last two, three years as well. And post rate cuts, after the first rate cut, uh, the dollar starts depreciating. And we can see it from the US dollar index as well. Uh, when you look at the numbers, we have seen US dollar uh, weakening. And going forward, we don't expect an even stronger US dollar to start with. And we expect uh, as a base case scenario uh, that US dollar should be either flattish or even weakening going forward after the rate cuts. Thanks, Emery, very clear. Uh, before I proceed, I would also just uh, remind our viewers to please ask any questions that you may have uh, along the way in the interactive Q&A function here on the right hand side of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer those. Uh, but moving on, 
Um, so East Capital's Global Frontier Market Strategy uh, with Emery at the helm is now fast approaching its 10-year uh, track record uh, with an excellent performance. Um, but what we're even more proud of, I would say, is the consistent performance where we've managed to uh, outperform the, the MSCI Frontier Markets benchmark in nine out of 10 years. And as you will see from uh, the next slide here, it's been a very good ride. Uh, so, Emre, what are the secrets behind this success? Sounds quite uh, funny when you put it that way, the secrets of the success. Uh, let's say we had a good ride over the last 10 years. I'm happy that we have the long track record now, I guess long enough to have been through many different cycles across 20 markets. It's not only one market or one global cycle, it's been so many different cycles as well. Uh, what makes me happy when, not, when I look at these charts is the one on the right hand side. Alpha generation, of course, absolute performance is uh, quite good, but alpha generation has been very consistent. Uh, we had nine out of 10 years of positive alpha, and it's been pretty consistent over the years. Uh, so that is also, I think, uh, quite explanatory when it comes to our investment style, investment approach. We like to invest where the opportunities are. We have the core investments with a long-term view, but there's always some tactical investments or maybe some uh, different dynamics. Uh, but if you ask me one single driver of the performance, I think it's been stock picking. We did have many allocation decisions, uh, but allocation decisions are typically binary. If we like a market, we invest in stocks in that market. If we don't like a market from a top-down perspective, we simply exit, but it is the uh, stock picking which has been paying off quite well over the longer term. Sure, thank you. And uh, particularly during the last three years, uh, performance has been exceptionally strong, um, as we saw outperforming the Frontier Markets benchmark, but in fact also outperforming developed market uh, indices, which we know have uh, performed very strongly. Um, so, uh, can you comment on, you know, this recent momentum and what's been been driving the performance, particularly in, in recent years? Mm -hmm. I, I think if there'll be one thing I'll take after this webinar, it should be that there is always opportunities in this big universe, big uncorrelated universe. Uh, this is also shown by consistency of performance. Uh, but also there is now momentum in majority of frontier markets over the last three years. Why last three years? I think uh, it's partly because it's post-COVID period. Uh, the vulnerable markets are shaken. Some of them are broken. Some of them are, uh, you know, getting stronger. But economic rebalancing has been taking place. Uh, we had, for instance, Pakistan, uh, which was on the verge of default last year. Eurobond yields with one year maturity was 100%. So you would get 100% in US dollar terms if you had invested in Pakistani euro bonds last year. Uh, so you had this kind of instances, but you had also some other instances where you had different challenges. But now there is the momentum uh, in the Middle East. It's not only about oil. I think it will take many more years for uh, many investors to realize that it's not only about oil anymore. Of course, oil is important. If oil goes down to 10, it's a different ball game. But if you are around 70, 80, when it comes to oil, uh, these are now significantly more stable economies with growing and big and huge um, public investment funds, you know, public wealth funds. And along with that, there are the reforms, there is more listed companies, and there are high dividend yields in peg currencies. So this is what we like about the region. If you look at Eastern European frontiers, uh, you have quite nice integration to the EU, stable currencies, stable markets, significantly cheaper valuations compared to other markets and high dividend yields in these stable currencies. Uh, then if you go to Asia, fast economic growth, uh, as we see in, the Viet in Vietnam and the Philippines. Plus, again, uh, we have some tactical opportunities in markets that are going through difficult times. In some of them, we simply don't invest. In some others, we are investing in recovery, which might be highly rewarding. But the point here is that I think um, not only against emerging markets and frontier markets index on the bottom right-hand side, this is versus indices. This is not absolute returns, 
absolute returns are even better, but versus uh, these two indices is good performance. But uh, yes, we can talk a lot about uh, NVIDIA, uh, that's the future AI, uh, but by investing in these fast growing markets, we are able to match and even exceed the performance of uh, even developed markets in US dollar terms. And talking about momentum, uh, I think uh, if you look at the blue markets here, just for the ease of uh, visualization, if you look at second half of 23 and overall 23 and year to date performance, it's mostly about blue markets. What does it mean? It means that uh, after this long period of economic rebalancing, risk appetite has been back. And along with that, uh, you have these markets performing quite well. On the individual markets, maybe without going too much into details, uh, you have structural growth stories uh, in Vietnam and the Philippines in Asia. Valuations are offering this kind of a gap compared to other Asian markets. So when you get uh, the right stocks in Vietnam and the Philippines, you might get it uh, right in terms of returns as well. And then again, uh, as I mentioned, you have individual opportunities such as the one we see in Pakistan with major potential uh, with rate cuts and economic growth acceleration as inflation went down from 40% to 10%, but central bank policy rate is uh, still around 20% levels. Thanks, Emre. Indeed, very impressive performance. Uh, just to leave our viewers with some even more concrete sort of uh, insights and facts. Um, how are you and your team positioning the fund in the current environment? Um, and you mentioned, you know, a few countries there. Uh, where do you see sort of the best opportunities going mm -hmm. forward? Mm -hmm. I think this tells the whole story. If you look at the indices and many other peers as well, especially on the emerging market side, you have very high concentration, uh, one dimensional uh, exposure but we have a pretty balanced exposure across different regions. That's one take uh, I think we can have out of the region allocations. In terms of earnings growth, we are achieving mid-teens type of earnings growth. This has been the average over the last 10 years. And again, think about this, uh, all the ESG challenges, corporate governance challenges, growth challenges, currency challenges. We have been talking about 15%, pretty consistent, EPS growth driven by you know uh, structured growth stories. That's why uh, we were able to maintain that growth. So we expect that to continue. And how do we expect that to continue? Uh, this we can share separately. It's a pretty busy table, including the top positions. But if you think about the strategy building blocks of the uh, of frontier markets for us, it's about banks. Approximately 40% of the strategy is in banks now, but the range has been 20 to 60% uh, over these 10 years. So we can have more or less investments in the banking sector. But what's to note here is that this is a pretty diverse um, list of banks from different markets, including Vietnam, but on, not only that, the UAE, Georgia, uh, Egypt. These banks, I think what's to keep in mind about them is that they have an ROE of, I mean, we have more than 15% for individual markets. It's a soft criteria and we keep it uh, at that. But if you look at our average ROE weighted by the banks that we hold, we have 27% ROE. That's pretty important because then every year you are compounding the equity by 27% on average. And these banks are uh, at one time, 1.2 times, price to book value and paying dividends at 8%. So it's quite good point for banks in many of these markets. Uh, but apart from that, we have some technology names growing very fast. Uh, the one that we have in Vietnam has been growing every year by 20% in the bottom line. Uh, Caspi in Kazakhstan, FinTech marketplace and different uh, businesses has been growing by 50. It's not going to be 50, it's going to be 20, 25%. Uh, but at 10 times PE, 20, 25% is still pretty attractive. And the mix of uh, all other names, uh, I, I don't find a way to summarize that, but that's the beauty of it. Uh, it's a big, you know, well diversified names in different markets, uh, but we have really fast growing grocery retail companies, LaBelle in Morocco, operating Carrefour brand 
in the country, a human soft education company in Kuwait, having 12% dividend yield effectively in US dollars due to the pegged currency, a reinsurance company in Saudi Arabia significantly cheaper than others uh, at three times book compared to five, six for other insurance companies. Healthcare companies, uh, Morocco, UAE, uh, Vietnamese retail company, another grocery retail, education, uh, telecom with mobile money operations, uh, Coke bottler in different markets, including Pakistan and Kazakhstan. So it's a wide range, uh, but if you take all the pieces together, uh, the point here is that we have a pretty solid base uh, with the finance sector, very cheap companies in the banking sector in growing markets, plus pretty stable companies across the world uh, investing in, uh, you know, fundamentally driven or structurally driven consumer names. Thanks, Emre. Um, we're running out of time here, I see, um, but clearly, we have gone through, you know, the strong performance that we've seen, uh, as well as the key sort of characteristics of our fund. Um, but looking ahead, we do indeed remain very optimistic about frontier markets, uh, despite the strong performance, of course, that we have seen. Uh, so, Emery, maybe you just want to leave our viewers with a few uh, sort of uh, thoughts as to um, why we we have this optimism looking forward as well. I think we had a small article a few years ago, maybe five, six, seven years ago. The topic was the subject was missing the forest for the trees. When it comes to frontier markets, we are uh, we are target of uh, every single, you know, uh, after every single FT headline, uh, because usually these markets show, don't show up with positive headlines, unfortunately. But the reality on the ground is completely different. I think performance, and this is a long enough track record along with so many cycles, times 20 markets, I think uh, that's important as well, uh, should be telling you the story. Uh, if anyone has any specific questions, uh, we are very eager to discuss. Uh, but I think the main message here is that we shouldn't miss the forest, the investment opportunity by looking at individual markets or day-to-day -day, uh, news that we see on the headlines. Uh, this is a good opportunity and it's an even better opportunity now that we are looking for a forward looking PE of uh, 6.8 times for 2025. Uh, I think uh, that gives you good enough downside protection with the valuations and uh, hopefully we'll continue to give the upside. Great, Emre. Very good final words. Um, and uh, from my side, I can just echo what Emre said there in case of any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to uh, to myself or any of my colleagues, um, and we're always eager to set up a call. So thanks again, Emre, for uh, your insights, and thanks to our viewers for dialing in, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.